Thank you for all of you who have taken part in the ministry today. I was enjoying myself so much, and then I had to realize I had to preach, so I had to get started here. Uh, resurrection morning. As I think of this day, there's a day that I'd like to preach on. It would be this morning, Resurrection Day, the greatest time in the Christian calendar, and so it's great you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 20, looking at that and be looking at a number of passages of Scripture throughout the message. You're reading from John 20, beginning at verse 1. Very familiar passage. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded, folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed in a couple of verses from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Peter, by the twelve, over five hundred at once, James and Paul, and I've just added that. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day that we can celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ coming out of the tomb, out of the grave. Thank you, Lord God, for the victory that we have because of Jesus Christ. Lord, I join with Matt and uh, pray for the people of Sri Lanka and ask you, Lord God, that you administer to them, to the families that are suffering, Lord, for your children minister to them at this time. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we have in this land of freedom and plenty, that we don't have to worry about being bombed, at least at this time. We want to thank you, God, that we always have an opportunity to know Jesus Christ in a personal way. So, Lord God, I just pray that my heart, my mind would be pure and clean before you, and the words that you've given to me over the last number of weeks would be empowered by your Holy Spirit to touch each one of our lives. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at Good Friday, of course, there was a, a tragedy. The disciples were wondering what happened, what took place. And of course, as God's word says, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. It was already mentioned many, many years ago that Jesus Christ would die on the cross. So we look at that tragedy of Good Friday, hanging on the cross, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, and he died a death. And of course... That was it. Well, we know it wasn't it. From tragedy, it became triumph. On this morning, many, many, many years ago, as scripture said, he was buried and he rose again the third day. And that he was seen by Peter, 12, more than 500, seen by James. And then as Paul says, he was seen by me. What a victory it was. So let's just do a little bit of a review of what happened on that Easter week that we call Easter week. A bit of an update. 
Jesus' agony in Gethsemane, Luke 22. As he prayed, he said, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. His disciples slept, and he prayed. And in the mockery of Jesus' trial, Pilate's wife said to Pilate, after she was having horrible dreams about this situation, said, have nothing to do with that just man. Have nothing to do with that just man. And it was a mockery because Pilate said, I don't find any fault in him. He said that three different times. Herod said, I find no fault in him. It was a mockery. And yet Jesus Christ died during that time. It's interesting as Jesus had the dialogue with these rulers. He knew very, very clearly it wasn't the rulers that would hang him on the cross. It was God, his father, that allowed that to happen because there was going to be a day down through the years that you and myself, if you accepted Jesus Christ, will come to that freedom because he died for us. The brutality of the beatings and the crucifixion. As I read that story, I just think of them bowing before him, mocking him. That robe, that purple robe on his back after it was bleeding and then to rip that robe off and then to be lashed and to hang on a cross. The brutality of the beatings and the crucifixion. Then Jesus was buried by two secret disciples. One we know very well, John chapter 3. Talked about Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, how can a man be born again? And then Jesus gave that great pronouncement in verse 16. To Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might believe. We recognize that John 3, that we have recorded in God's word, was the time, was the story where Nicodemus became that secret disciple. And he and Joseph of Arimathea were the two that took Jesus to be buried. God's word says that Joseph of Arimathea came in and begged the body of Jesus took him down off the cross along with his other secret disciple, Nicodemus, I believe, and they buried the Lord Jesus Christ so tenderly. And of course, Jesus was raised from the dead after three days. The Jews were always trying to figure out what was going on. Paul says the Jews, they... uh, Kind of look for signs. And the Greeks, they are really interested in wisdom. And it goes on to talk about the power of God. So in this particular situation, the Jews are saying to Jesus in Matthew 12, give us a sign. Give us a sign to prove that you are really who you say you are. And Jesus said to them, Whereas Jonah was in the body of the fish, three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth, three days and three nights. Jesus was raised from the dead after three days. And then that entrance into heaven. Thank you, Aaron, that was a great illustration. You just got my prop ready as you shared today. Acts chapter 1 took place where Jesus was ready to go back to the Father. And as he was going up to heaven, God's word records that there were two angels who were talking to the disciples and said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up 
into the sky, this same Jesus who was taken from you will return in like manner as you see him go up. And of course, we know that Jesus Christ is the one that is going to come for those who know him in a personal way. So as he went up into heaven, the disciples watched. And then, of course, we know from that time on, the Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost. What a powerful time. Jesus said very clearly that there was going to be a day that things would change. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but you will receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, including Canada. Jesus gave that great pronouncement, and then we find in Scripture, Acts chapter 2, that that really, really did happen. Changed their life forever, and of course, that's the evidence of the resurrection, of the impact of the, the resurrection upon the disciples and upon us today as well. We find that there is that resurrection power shown in Acts chapter 4. It's a beautiful day, maybe like today. And Peter and John were going to the temple to have a prayer time, as they always did. Little Jewish boys would always go to the temple at about age 12, they would have what they called a bar mitzvah, where they become what they would say into manhood. So they were going to the temple as they did for years. But they were accosted by a man who'd been laying there day after day after day after day after day. He was looking for alms, and of course that was a good place for him to be because People, as you're going into church, they thought, well, this is a good time to give some money. And so I'll just sit here and I'll collect alms so I can get enough money to feed myself and my family during the day. So he was begging alms of Peter and John, and Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I say to you, rise up. And walk. Scripture says that he reached down, grabbed the man by his hand, and lifted him up. Scripture continued to say, he went into the temple leaping and singing because of the healing power of the Holy Spirit to the life of Peter and John. And then we have a big debate coming up because of this. They get themselves into trouble, but things have already happened. It's a little bit too late. Pentecost, we know from Scripture that over 3,000 came to Christ and were baptized that day, Acts chapter 2. And then during this time, as Peter preached, we find Scripture says that more than 5,000 came to know Christ after the preaching of this great event. Not only did, did we see from Scripture that there were 8,000, but it's at 8,000 men. So we can believe that there were many women and many children that came to Christ as a result of the preaching of Peter during these days. Here we find ourselves the evidence, the power of the resurrection, as the disciples are being challenged by the leaders. They're brought before the Sanhedrin, the religious legal system. Of course, the leaders are really upset with what's happening. And we see that in our country today, just as we talked about. And we prayed for this situation in Sri Lanka. As, Paul, as Matt said, Satan hates the gospel of Jesus Christ. He will do whatever he can to destroy men and women. Very same back there in Acts chapter 4. The disciples are being questioned by the Sanhedrin. 
the angry leaders asked a couple of questions. And I just love this passage of Scripture because they said, by what power or by what name have you done this? How dare you pray for somebody and how dare you allow him to get into the temple? They asked us two questions. By what power? Well, the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, you would receive power. And at that time, they had that power, the power of the Holy Spirit, to do things that only the Holy Spirit could do. Raise Christ from the dead, change the disciples' lives, raise the lame man at this particular time. And then it says, by what name? By what name? And the name, of course, is Jesus Christ. Do you know him today? Was there a time in your life you said yes to Jesus? Recognizing very clearly that you had sin in your life and you knew that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, was the only one that could save you. And you bowed your heart and bowed your head and said, Lord Jesus, I need you. I open the door of my heart and of my life and I invite you to come in. Forgive me of all my sins. Make me to be the person you want me to be. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live the Christian life the way you want me to live the Christian life. If you've never done that today, friends, I just trust that you would do it today. If you have not done that before, that you would do that today. The greatest thing that ever happened in my life was that day, many, many, many years ago, when I went forward and said yes to Jesus, and I know I wouldn't be living today without that. And I'm so very, very thankful. By what power? The power of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps today you're feeling a little tug in your heart. Maybe you're a believer. But you realize that you're not living the way you need to live. And you're feeling some conviction. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, reminding of you, you that you need to live a life that glorify the Lord Jesus. Or perhaps you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus. And let me encourage you to do that. Give you opportunity a little later. By what power? The Holy Spirit. By what name? Acts 4, 7. And when they set them in the midst, when the religious leaders set the disciples, the apostles, in their midst, they asked, by what power? Or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man. By what means he has been made well? Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. And he goes on and he gives that testimony and he gives that challenge. He gives that salvation message and says, neither is there salvation in any other. See, there have been a lot of religious leaders that wanted to be leaders, kings, and yet they couldn't save anybody. But Peter says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Verse 13 is an awesome verse. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Remember the story? Jesus was praying in the garden. The disciples were sleeping. And then as they went down the, the mount, the leaders and the soldiers leading Jesus, the scripture said, but Peter followed afar off. And we know the story of his denial. Three times he said, I never knew him. I don't know him, I don't know him. Now what a difference. 
Here he has his finger in his face, in the eyes of the religious leaders. And he says, let me tell you by what power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what name. The name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God. They took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. Oh, not before the resurrection. They were a bunch of scared chickens like we would have been. But after the resurrection, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus after he was raised from the grave. And dear ones, that makes the difference in our life. When we have the resurrected Jesus Christ in our life, we can live with power and with grace. Some of the evidences we want to look at for a few moments. The Holy Spirit's power worked in Christ to raise him from the dead. The empty tomb, up from the grave, he rose. He sang that beautiful, beautiful song. Death could not keep its prey. God's word says, and the song says, he tore the bars away. It's interesting, as they went down to look after the body of Jesus, the women noticed that the stone was rolled away. As I thought about that, I just thought about the special things that God does. We know that it was the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. But just as kind of a little bit of a corollary, in Scripture it says, and an angel went down and moved the stone away. (laughs) Don't you think the Holy Spirit had enough power to raise Christ from the dead? Do the same thing? No. I would think that maybe God the Father said, Gabriel, or Michael, the archangel, got a job for you. Why don't you just go down to earth and just move that stone so the ladies can get in and see that my son isn't there. See, God does some very, very special things in our life if we allow that to happen. And to me, that was a very, very special thing as I thought about that over the last couple of weeks. Secondly, the Holy Spirit power placed him at God the Father's own right hand. Scripture says in Hebrews 7 that Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. Do you know, dear ones, if you belong to him, he prays for you every day. All you have to do is look at John 17. Scripture says, not only do I pray for these, the disciples, but I pray for all those who believe in my name. He makes intercession for us. And that's why when we get struggling with things, we're fearful, we just don't know where to turn, we can call out to the Lord Jesus who makes intercession for us. We know the Holy Spirit does as well, but certainly Jesus does. And then the power is for us. Paul says in Ephesians 3.10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. That was the verse that I chose at my grade 12 graduation, graduated from Kieranport High School, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. And over the years, whether it was in counseling or teaching or preaching or dealing with deliverance and demons and so on, I saw the power of Almighty God. I saw the power of the Holy Spirit at work in my life. I knew it wasn't me, it was him. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. And I trust that's for you as well. And then we find the power in Ephesians 1. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, to you? If you're a believer in Christ, it's for you. According to the working of the mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, the resurrection power, 
when he raised him from the dead and set him at the right hand of the heavenly Father. What a blessing that is. Paul states in Romans 8, but if the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, that Holy Spirit will also quicken or make alive your mortal body. That's who we have in Jesus Christ because of the resurrection. God's power placed Christ above every principality and power. Far above all principalities and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. You know, when I was a new Christian, I didn't understand very much about God's power and Satan's power. And I had kind of the attitude like maybe a lot of Christians had, or the non-saved have, that it's really a tug-of-war between Satan and Jesus. And one day, Jesus kind of wins because he tugs a little bit more than Satan does. The next day, Satan wins because he tugs a little bit more. But no, Scripture said he's the head of all principalities and power. One day, as Scripture says in Revelation 20, Jesus is going to send one angel and look after Satan. One angel look after Satan. That power. God's power gave Christ a unique position. Philippians 2, as was mentioned by Pastor Matt. God has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what, dear friends? If we were to die today, we would see Jesus and we would bow before him. Some people have said to me, I'll never bow before Jesus Christ. And by now, they've already done that. They've already met the King of kings and Lord of lords. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Another evidence, God's power put everything under Christ's feet. He anointed him to be the head of the church the deacons and the elders and the lead pastor are not at the head of the church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's why it's very, very important for us as leaders to know what Jesus is telling us to do because he is the head of the church. Let's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. And that beautiful verse out of Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I would be really remiss, friends, if I just stopped it here. But I think it's very, very important to pull it together and talk about an application. The application... The resurrection morning is, have I made a personal commitment to Christ? There's been a time in my life I said yes to Jesus. Thank you for forgiving my sins. I'm so thankful that he's forgiven my sins. He didn't do that because I'm a good guy. It's just the opposite. I know my own sinfulness. I'm very thankful for his forgiveness, for his cleansing. And then for the believer... Do I desire to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and confess my sin immediately? When we sin, we ask God to forgive us, and he will. If we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you live that way, Christian, every day? I encourage you to do that. It's the best way to live. And then, this is my desire for God's word and prayer show in my witness for Christ. The people know around us that we are a follower of Christ, that we really belong to him and we want to serve him. And let's pray. Almighty God, 
We want to thank you for the resurrection. Lord, perhaps there's some here today that need to say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I've never done what Bruce has said. I've never asked Jesus to come into my life. And I want to do that today. And friends, you could pray a simple prayer like this, Lord Jesus, I know I've sinned and I need you to save me and I ask you to come into my heart and into my life and forgive me. Make me into the person you want me to be. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for coming into my life. And then Christian, on this resurrection morning, are you living the way God wants you to live? Perhaps you need to pray a prayer like this. Almighty God, I come to you in the powerful name of Jesus, and I ask you to wash me and to cleanse me, to forgive me, and help me to be the child of God that you want me to be. Lord, thank you for your love and your presence, your power. Thank you for that resurrection power, the greatest day in the Christian calendar. We love you today, Lord, and thank you in Christ's name. Amen.